I'm Francis Durnley, and this is Ukraine, the latest. Today, we offer a broad strategic overview of the military situation, consider the new defensive pact between Britain and Germany, and return to the BRICS summit in Russia, where the UN Secretary General arrived amid a storm of criticism. Bravery takes you through the most unimaginable hardships to finally reward you with victory. The first duty of my government is security and defence, to make clear our unshakable support of NATO and with our allies towards Ukraine. Keep stand strong. Nobody's going to break us. We're strong. We're Ukrainians. It's Wednesday, the 23rd of October, two years and 248 days since the full-scale invasion began. And today I'm joined by our Associate Editor of Defence, Dominic Nichols, and our Senior Foreign Correspondent, Roland Oliphant. Before turning to Dom on the significant new defensive pact signed in London this morning with Germany, I started by summarising the latest military updates. While far from being all quiet on the Eastern Front, fighting continues to be intense across the entire theatre. There are no confirmed territorial gains or losses for either Ukraine or Russia over the past 24 hours in Donetsk or Luhansk regions. Russian forces continued offensive operations along the Kupiansk Zavove Kramina line, but did not make any confirmed advances, according to the ISW and others. Likewise, their forces continued offensive operations east of Seversk, but there are no confirmed changes as things stand. Furthermore, Russian forces continued limited offensive operations in northern Kharkiv Oblast, but sources state operations northeast of Kharkiv City and southwest of Ovchansk were unsuccessful. In the Kursk salient, there has been some modest movement, however, with Russian forces recently advancing in the northern part and intense fighting and counterattacks from Ukraine taking place southeast of Koronevo. Meanwhile, Ukrainian forces continue to conduct a series of drone strikes last night and the night before, targeting distilleries in Russia that reportedly manufacture products for the Russian military, as Dom discussed yesterday. We also hear this morning the first official confirmation from the United States that North Korean troops have gone to Russia. Kyiv's military intelligence chief, too, Badanov, who listeners will recall we interviewed back in February, has warned that, quote, we are waiting for the first units tomorrow in the Kursk direction, though he didn't specify how many would be deployed. The South Koreans, too, are becoming increasingly vocal over this issue. A government official in Seoul claimed that Pyongyang has sent fighter pilots to Vladivostok in the Russian Far East. The South Korean news agency reports a government source stating South Korea is considering sending military personnel, likely from intelligence units, to Ukraine to monitor North Korean forces' tactics and combat capabilities and to question captured North Koreans. The source also reportedly stated that Seoul will prioritise giving Ukraine defensive weapons over lethal aid, but if it were able to provide lethal weapons, Seoul will first try to find a way to provide them indirectly to Ukraine. I think a very fascinating development, the uh, South Korean and the Pacific axis and how that's being developed as a consequence of what's going on at the moment. Now, we're going to use this opportunity of a slight lull on the front lines to offer a broad strategic summary of where we are at this moment. Despite Russia's full commitment, its year-long offensive has failed to meet its objectives. Russia has achieved a net gain of only 0.1% of Ukrainian territory after a year of continuous offensives. Moscow is struggling with recruitment and has repeatedly increased signing bonuses. It also has, of course, a strained economy and has as a result, led to the requirement of using North Korean soldiers. It's also losing equipment faster than it can produce replacements, hence why its dwindling Soviet-era stock has been more reported more increasingly over recent days. Despite fully committing to mobilisation, including the use of prisoners, and suffering what many estimate to be over 600,000 casualties, its progress falls far short of expectations. But... All of that said, Ukraine too is in a precarious situation. As Jack Watling has written in an absolutely superb summary for foreign affairs, Ukraine must turn the tide before it can consider negotiation. Now, I'm going to quote from 
Mr Watling's piece quite extensively, but I think it's worth it for the overview he provides. So he says... Though the details of the victory plan remain in question, the underlying analysis that shapes Zelensky's pitch is sound. Putin will negotiate seriously only if he believes he is losing militarily. To conclude the war on favourable terms, Ukraine must stabilise the front, gain maximum leverage over Russia and obtain security guarantees to ensure that it can prosper and remain secure after the conflict. To achieve those aims, Kyiv must be clearly aligned with its international allies. As things stand now, the Kremlin believes it can achieve its objectives militarily and is therefore not interested in immediate negotiations or withdrawal. Ukrainian forces have become dangerously stretched. They are now spread along a 600-mile front line and recruitment and training has failed to make up for the number of casualties in front line units. Furthermore, Ukraine's supplies of artillery, ammunition, tanks and infantry fighting vehicles have been dwindling. The more it lacks these key types of equipment and weaponry, the more it must depend on infantry to hold the front, causing an associated rise in casualties. Russia's current battlefield advantages rest on several capabilities. First, the thinning out of Ukraine's tactical air defences from late 2023 has allowed Russia to establish continuous and dense drone surveillance. Russia now flies between 1,000 and 1,300 long-range reconnaissance drones over Ukrainian territory every day, providing Russia with valuable targeting data. Russian units use ballistic missiles to strike Ukraine's air defensives if Ukraine tries to move them forward, as loitering munitions, unscrewed missiles designed to search and strike targets, scour the rear parts of Ukraine's front lines to destroy its artillery. The threat from Russian loitering munitions and glide bombs forces Ukraine to keep its artillery away from the front, which in turn allows Russian forces to move their own artillery closer, bringing them into the range of Ukrainian logistics units, medics and troops rotating behind the front line. This pressure compels Ukrainian troops to remain in prepared fighting positions where they are safe from shrapnel. Meanwhile, Russia sends small groups forward to force the Ukrainians in fighting positions to expend ammunition and prevent them from resting. Once the fighting positions have been identified, the Russian forces call in airstrikes with 500 to 1500 kilogram glide bombs, which can hit the positions with considerable accuracy. When the Ukrainians try to rotate their units, they are harassed by artillery. Then, when the defensive positions have been thinned, the Russians attempt rapid assaults on motorbikes, often supported by armoured vehicles, to get into the Ukrainian trenches. To reverse this dynamic, Ukraine will need to do several things at once. First, it needs to limit Russia's battlefield surveillance capabilities. Ukraine has developed effective interceptor drones that can knock down Russian surveillance drones, but it needs assistance scaling up. Ukraine's Western partners should also augment this effort by expanding support in electronic warfare to interfere with the passage of Russian reconnaissance data. At the same time, Ukraine needs to make that artillery far more effective, and it needs more howitzers and ammunition. Ukrainian forces still need approximately 2.4 million rounds a year just to hold the front. Kyiv also needs to dig new defensive lines behind its current positions, with experienced soldiers supervising to make sure that civilian construction workers build the positions properly. Kyiv must also fix its dysfunctional recruitment and training system. Training for new troops has been inadequate. Funding for and support of Ukraine's own long-range strike programmes and aggressive targeting of Russia's supply chains of raw materials, machine tooling and critical components of weapons production can have a significant effect. Europe and the US should be able to help Ukraine force Russia to burn through more of its munitions and to degrade the Russian defence industry's capability to replenish its supplies. In combination, these steps could make further advances prohibitively costly for Russia but they would need to be applied systematically and at scale. Now, lastly, Jack Watling writes in the piece, it would be particularly dangerous if Ukraine was forced into negotiations as the situation at the front continues to unravel in Russia's favour. This would create a Brest-Litovsk dynamic. In 1918, German forces achieved conditions in which they could advance with impunity against the Red Army. And therefore, when the Soviets entered talks, any attempt to push back on a German demand would cause the German army to renew offensive operations until the Soviets conceded. In such a scenario, Moscow would effectively force Kyiv to all but concede its sovereignty at gunpoint. Thus, Zelensky remains absolutely correct that a lasting peace can only be secured with ironclad security guarantees to Kyiv. 
Satisfying this will be delicate. For the US, the prospect of extending new long-term security guarantees to a large territory is hardly enticing. Amid Washington's year-long efforts to pivot its resources to the Indo-Pacific to deter China, such a step would require it to divert some resources. The solution to Ukraine's security needs will therefore have to involve a coalition of the willing to deploy to Ukraine after a ceasefire is reached, with the US at least voicing its support. European powers, therefore, will need to ramp up their investments in European defence industries to credibly backstop any security guarantees offered to Ukraine. After nearly three years of war, Ukraine finds itself in a better position than many expected. But a favourable outcome is far from guaranteed and no time for complacency remains. Despite their potential reluctance to sign on to Zelensky's victory plan, Western powers must act quickly to secure and avoid losing the vital leverage that Ukraine will need to achieve an end to the war and that does not empower Russia. Positive signs abound. The Australian government's announcement that it will provide M1A1 tanks to Ukraine, Sweden's provision of a large tranche of infantry fighting vehicles and the US's commitment to supply additional equipment before the end of the year. But the time to act is now. So, quoting there quite extensively from Jack Watling of Rusi in Foreign Affairs, and we will link to that in the show notes. I've had to abridge it, but I think those are many of the key points. I hope listeners will forgive me for quite extensively quoting from that, but a fascinating and important piece, I think. But on to the next important subject. Dom, you've had a busy morning scurrying around London for this new UK-German defence agreement. Quite a significant one to this. We've already talked about it a little bit this week in advance, but what was it like being there and what was the mood in the room? Dominic Nichols. Yeah, thanks, Francis. So, I mean, I think what I was at this morning was the embodiment of this new desire. As Jack says, European powers will need to ramp up their investments in European defence industries, blah, blah, blah. The time to act is now. I think that's what I've just been at. So I went over to uh, Trinity House, which is right next to the Tower of London, a very nice part of town. And uh, it's the home, and I'll come back to it, it's the home of the UK Lighthouse Authority. Right, hold that thought, because there were some really clunky gags from from the uh, all the ministerial teams and the civil servants what have you but it's the home to the UK lighthouse authorities trinity house this was for the signing of a new UK germany defence agreement by uh, so well we had the british defence secretary john healy and german defence secretary boris pistorius now you might say germany and britain pretty good allies for a little while now at least and all members of nato uh, do lots of exercising together, allies and allies, friends and friends. So what's this new treaty all about? A very good question, I would suggest. So I think a lot of this is posturing and politicking rather than actual hard military stuff. There's a lot of hard military stuff as well, but I think it's mainly uh, mainly symbolic, uh, which is very important. I'm not, I'm not denying that. John Healy said this is a very significant day. This is a landmark agreement. It marks the historic deepening of defence relationships. He said, um, pacts such as this will be the driving force behind the, this is Britain's NATO first strategy and a reset of UK relationship with Europe. Now, he mentioned that bit twice, the reset of UK's relationship with Europe, uh, which I think, as I say, I think that's, that's quite a lot of what's going on here. So there's a lot of plates spinning in the room, but Britain post-Brexit relationship with, with Europe is definitely in, in the mix there. But essentially, this is about drawing closer cooperation between the two militaries and the two defence industrial complexes. Boris Pistorius, is, um, I mean, he, he, he apologised at one point for his strong German accent, but I can assure you his English was much better than my, than my German, as I learned to my cost when I said hello to the, uh, to the German ambassador again, but never mind, story for another day. Um, he said he's great pals with John Healy. He said that actually... Uh, so this is Boris Pistorius. He, he made a joke. He said his his wife had started to question that why he's seen more of John Healy in the last month uh, than he has of of her. Um, anyway, answer on a postcard. He said uh, so. Boris Pistorius, in terms of support for Ukraine, Ukraine, he said we we will continue to support Ukraine together. John Healy said that this defence agreement paves the way for for an intergovernmental agreement to be signed early next year. So early next year is going to be some big overarching political um, agreement between the UK and Germany and this bit falls underneath that umbrella. This is the defence part of it. So Britain and Germany getting much closer together, good industrial stuff, good allied stuff, 
with the background context all of course being um, Europe taking taking a greater uh, role uh, in its own security the question was asked about US post election and you know is this Trump proofing and they said look we don't know who's going to win uh, and regardless of that Europe, Europe's got to do more so this is Europe doing more so there was some there were some um, hard announcements. There's going to be a new artillery gun barrel factory opened in the in the UK. It's going to be uh, there's hundreds of jobs and um, half a billion pounds boost to the British economy. Although you know, in question, that's over ten years, so fifty million quid a year. Good, you know, not to be sniffed at fifty million quid, but you know, it's not not massive. Um, that's going to be opened by Raimatal. Raimatal. Um, that's going to be the first time we've manufactured gun barrels in the UK in 10 years. It's going to be using British steel in from, from Sheffield. First gun barrels rolling off the line in 2027. So, you know, good good one there. Nice one. You know, more, more gun barrels. Also, just... Uh, so that, that was kind of trailed and then announced at the at the press conference and I've got some a few more a bit more detail in the last few minutes. German defence firm Helsing, which is quite a new um, new defence contractor on of of any great size it's been around for a while but on in sort of big defense contractors it's it's a relative newcomer specializing in uh, ai and that kind of thing already got a hundred million pound investment in the uk well they've they've more than trebled that they've added another 350 million pound investment in in the uk today specifically for ai with the application or some of the application of that investment going to be in ukraine in the next 12 months now i had to dig into quite what this is going to be so when i when i asked oh, brilliant so uh, what what's what's this all going to be all these announcements they were they were pegged these these sort of defense industry stuff they were known they were called lighthouse initiatives which i mean makes absolutely no sense until you realize that you sat in trinity house and it's the home of the uk lighthouse authority as i say so quite what a lighthouse initiative is as opposed to any other defense industrial you like that? Yeah, I like houses, but I like to like lighthouses. Anyway, so I was first of all told that this Helsing investment in AI is going to be, quote, scaling capabilities linked to the lighthouse initiatives. So then when I said, brilliant, thanks for that, um, what does that mean? I was told it's going to be an own brand platform carrying a range of payloads. Again, I said, that's fascinating. Thank you so much. Very clear. Just one final question from, from silly old Dom. What what are you talking about? And I was told, all right, look, it's going to be a low-cost drone with different roles through software that can be digitally stabilised. Um, so you've got digitally stabilised imagery, so you don't need fancy um, stabilised gimbals. Same for navigation, all that kind of stuff. Right, brilliant. So it's going to be clever drones. Great. Good investment. Nice investment there. Other bits and pieces. Uh, Britain and Germany are going to be uh, working jointly to develop uh, new deep strike weapons uh, quote that can travel further and with more precision than current systems including storm shadow unquote so aha we we say uh, in questions we go right brilliant working on a joint munition but the the current zeitgeist in this sort of game is all about who gives policy permissions and the more that countries come together to work together on these big defense contracts well surely that, that just brings this whole issue of who can issue permissions or more importantly who can veto where these weapons can go that that becomes more of, more of an issue. So Boris Pistorius was asked, you know, is Germany going to uh, is Germany going to veto? Let's say, for example, this new joint munition. If Britain wants in the future at some point to gift it to Ukraine or in a similar scenario, would Germany veto that? And he said, this is not the time to answer that. <laughs> that's that's well down the road. Um, dodge dodge dodge, weave weave weave. Uh, specifically on Taurus, he was asked he was asked why aren't you why aren't you going to give Taurus to to Ukraine? And he just said, there's been no change to German policy, quote, for reasons I'm not allowed to discuss publicly. So there we go. No change on Taurus and uh, no no comment about future vetoes about um, policy permissions. Other stuff going on. Britain and Germany are going to be working together to protect critical underwater infrastructure. Uh, they say they're going to be working together to protect the vital cables in the seabed on the North Sea. And then said this includes exploring new off-board undersea surveillance capabilities to improve detection of adversary activity. Now, in the old days, you had the SOSA sound and something system, a load of infrastructure on the seabed between the Greenland Iceland and UK gap, literally acoustic systems that would listen for Russian submarines. So Russian subs coming out of Murmansk. Well, it sounds like something similar is going to is going to be developed again. This underwater infrastructure. 
combined with German P-8 uh, planes, and we call them Poseidon in, in, the, in the RF, in British military service, but the German Navy, they operate the same aircraft. I don't know if they still call them Poseidon, but anyway, it's the P-8 plane, the anti-submarine warfare plane um, that RF Lossiemouth up in Scotland that at the moment Brits and Norwegians can use, well, Germany is going to get involved with that as well. So the German Navy is going to fly their P-8s out of Lossy, all part of that whole um, plugging the uh, Greenland-Iceland-UK gap, um, listening for Russian subs. Now then, we then went to Q&A. Q&A was, uh, was interesting and, and rather delightfully on the record. It's always very dull when you go to these, these things and the, and the question and answer, which is often the most interesting bit, is all off the record. It's like, well, that's because you're, that's because you're worried about saying something that you wish you hadn't said. But anyway, so it was, it was good when they, when, they, when they leave it on the record. So we started talking about, uh, talking about Ukraine. And Boris Pistorius said that, uh, said that Europe had woken up in 2014 with the invasion of, of Crimea and eastern eastern Ukraine. He said the Baltic and Scandinavian countries woke up in 2014. Uh, we woke up, and then qualified that, saying Germany, Britain, France, and other countries in Europe. He said we woke up, but then pushed the snooze button, and we lost almost eight years. We now have to speed up. This is our task. I mean, pretty... Um, honest, I would say. I mean, I think we'd all go, yep, yeah, we, we recognise that, um, Boris. But um, to actually have him say, yeah, we hit the snooze button, I think it was quite, uh, quite refreshing from a, a senior minister. Uh, so we talked about uh, the snooze button uh, for a little bit. Then got on to, uh, we asked them about North Korean troops. And um, John Healy said, or they both said they, they, they think it's highly likely John Healy used those words highly likely which as you remember for me bashing it into you for ages the, the probability yardstick highly likely means over 70% certain so John Healy using some quite firm language there highly likely North Korean troops have been deployed although they didn't know numbers the type and role of the forces or any dispositions are you where they've where they've been sent but John Healy said there's now an indivisible link with security concerns in the Indo-Pacific area. And what he meant was that those comments that Jack Watling, um, well, he, he made similar comments earlier on about uh, South Korea getting very, uh, very interested in what North Korea is doing in support of Russia. Uh, John Healy making the point that, that Euro-Atlantic security, specifically over Ukraine, is now, is now linking the world together, linking the world in terms of threat and allies and what have you. So Boris Pistorius answered the similar point. He said international conflicts are approaching very rapidly. He made the reference to the link between North Korea and Russia and the impact on South Korea. He said North Korean actions have impact on the North Korean relationship with China. And that, in turn, impacts the China-India-Russia relationship. He continued, so we see the international conflicts are getting more and more closer to each other and linked to each other. It makes an approach for de-escalation harder. I'm quite concerned at the development. So, yeah, we've mentioned it a few times now, but there you go. You've got on the record from two defence ministers, two very senior um, NATO partners, saying they're particularly concerned about this development and the linking of Euro-Atlantic and Indo-Pacific security concerns. And that whole, as I said the other day, you know, it may have, Putin may have, got, may have got a few troops out of it, but actually by involving North Korea... Has he made a big mistake? Because South Korea are now very, very concerned. We think they're, as we heard earlier, going to be sending people to assist Ukraine, not only in interrogation, but also there will undoubtedly be some swapping of technology. They, they've signed a massive deal with Poland over tanks. So th South Korea has woken up and definitely not hit the snooze button. So all in all, it was, um, you could say, Francis, that a lot of it was, was words and symbolism. But right now, I think that does have more cachet than the normal, given the, the the shifting in the tectonic plates of international global security. Yes, there were there were a few hard hard um, defence announcements of, like I say, art, artillery gun barrels and AI drones and and what have you. But I think it was the symbolism of the two men standing together saying we're we're going to be taking this seriously and and, and basically putting their hands up and saying we we got it wrong eight years ago. So yeah, I thought it was. Um, the mood music seemed quite good. They're clearly pally, the two, the two men, the, the teams that were all sort of hovering nearby. They, they clearly worked um, at pace recently. This government's only been in for just over 100 days, the British government. So they've worked at pace on this. 
Um, they've got a few bits and bobs over the line that may already have been in train beforehand. Of course, new governments always take take the credit for what's gone before. Fair enough, that's politics. But they do seem to have a genuine a genuine desire to to get going. And uh, even though we were kept kept waiting by about 45 minutes beforehand with uh, civil servants coming around saying, it's going to start in four minutes. Can you sit down? It's going to start in four minutes. Please, please sit down. Like, Brilliant. Another four minutes came and went. I went and had another cup of tea. Uh, but no, it was eventually, I thought, quite a, a good event. And we will hopefully hear more of the of how that docks into this wider um, intergovernmental agreement early in the new year, Francis. Well, thanks, Don, for navigating us through the choppy waters of the pact, especially for your clear-eyed, comprehensive technological assessment, which left no room for any confusion whatsoever. Great use of the German word zeitgeist, too. But anyway, on to BRICS, the summit, of course, in Russia that's been the cause of so much controversy in the last couple of days. The UN Secretary General Guterres arrived in Russia for that summit today. He received a taste of the bread of hospitality that Russia put out. It's a tradition in Russia for salt and bread to be given to guests. So photographs of him smiling as he received that. Putin's given a speech. He said, we are all witnessing the development of BRICS and the expansion of its role in global affairs, said Putin. BRICS includes like-minded sovereign countries that represent different models of development, civilizations, and cultures. Now, the UN Secretary General is expected to deliver a speech at the summit. We didn't know that, which is interesting. His deputy spokesman has also confirmed that he does plan to meet Putin tomorrow, Thursday, where he will reaffirm his well-known positions on the war in Ukraine and the conditions for just peace based on the UN Charter. He will continue to pursue his efforts to re-establish safe navigation in the Black Sea, which is critically important for global food and energy security, especially for the most vulnerable countries around the world. Now, Roland, it's been a few days since we've had you on the podcast and this news was announced formally of the attendance of the UN Secretary General. Where do you want to start on this? What are your thoughts? Uh, hello, Francis. Um, well, look, at one, at one level, it's it's theatre and symbolism, right? And, and we shouldn't um, underplay the importance of theatre and symbolism. The theatre and symbolism is obviously the point that, you know... Two and a half years ago, uh, Vladimir Putin was meant to be entirely internationally isolated. You know, a man who, well, in Russian, you'd say unshake handable. That's a clunky translation, but you get the idea. You know, the kind of person that you just no one could shake hands with. But here he is, you know, uh, not only meeting, but hosting some of the world's, you know, most powerful people. Uh, Xi Jinping is there. Um, and it's not just the, the old allies. We've got Egypt, Iran, uh, India, Ethiopia, Brazil, all these countries showing up. Um, and it's a, it's a demonstration of the fact that Mr. Putin is not as isolated as his enemies would, would like to think. Um, and then, of course, you already have him. Just let me pull this up because I think I've got a quote referencing his favorite thing the multipolar world he said that a multipolar world is being created in challenge to the u.s dominated world order BRICS meets the aspirations of the main part of the international community the so-called world majority now the multipolar world is not a phrase that vladimir putin has just pulled out of nowhere or a speech writer has made up this is a this is an absolute perennial of russian foreign policy thinking going back way 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 back into the distant past and it it is kind of born out of the um, resentments at the kind of post-cold war settlement the narrative basically goes during the cold war you had a a bipolar world you had moscow and washington the two poles around which the rest of the world kind of revolved and then you had a unipolar moment um, which was when washington was basically you know the united states was the the sole undisputed superpower bestriding the world stage and ever since russian diplomats, officials, Vladimir Putin, other people have been talking about for years and years and years about how it was time for a unipolar world, um, a world that in their view would be much more just, a world where it wouldn't just be the United States telling other people what to do. There would be many, many different centers of power and they have they have all kinds of theories. There's all kinds of kind of talking and, and chewing over this idea going back for many, many, many years. And it all boils down to this this grand plan, this grand vision of one day rewriting the post-Cold War order, um, setting up a, a kind of a new world order. And you can see it in some of the big ideas being discussed. It's a, one of the things they're discussing is... Um, I, I get, some Someone's going to write in and tell me I've got this wrong, but, but uh, something along the lines of a new global currency or a trading system that doesn't depend on 
the an international payment system that doesn't depend on the dollar. You've got President Lula of, of Brazil pushing this today, and so on. Now, do most of the countries in the world want to start trading in or putting their putting their national reserves into rupees or yuan or, or rubles? I don't know. Um, and then, which country is going to um, you know? be the the underwriter of this new global currency um probably wouldn't be russia probably china you would imagine um so all kinds of technical difficulties with that but that's the that's the big vision and and that vision kind of goes hand in hand in a way with what's happening in ukraine uh, because that that idea that concept is kind of melded joined at the waist with the idea of restoring Russian greatness and the empire and so on. It's difficult to kind of put your put a line between um, the two, as it were. But I'd also note, Francis, I mean, you know, you shouldn't, you shouldn't downplay the significance of that. You shouldn't downplay the fact that world leaders, not just from, you know, Iran and China, um, who are very much in the Russian camp, but also, you know, Western allies like Egypt are showing up at these things. That, that should not be downplayed. But then there are serious practical difficulties here if you're talking about creating a new block a new great um russian led you know i don't know warsaw pact or whatever you want to call it um simply because these are these are countries that have their own conflicts with one another um you've got china and india um sitting at the same table um who have a, a lot of problems with one another um egypt and ethiopia are there they've got a lot of problems with one another so 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 lots of questions um lots of theater i suspect it's not going to go much further than things like the uh, the cis the shanghai cooperation organization things like that and um, the these perennial efforts to to create a uh, an alternative kind of forum a, a russian led global forum don't usually go that far but that is the context and those are the kinds of thoughts that i i imagine a kind of you know, the lava unflowing under the surface that, that, that leads to this kind of effort. Thanks, Ronan. And you've talked about the moving chess pieces of international diplomacy. I was rather sceptical of the analogies of chess and war, but it's the best that we have. So let's go to Endgame and that subject, which, as I say, you've talked about a lot. Where do you think we are at the moment as things are moving forward on the subject of negotiations and that sort of Endgame? So... I keep seeing these these things, these discussions about you know a possible end to the war, and of course we we had that that fascinating discussion with uh, Lieutenant Yulia Mikotenko of the Fifty Fourth Brigade last week. Um, I sat down and had a conversation with her after that, where she was talking about you know how she would feel about all this discussion of. Um, of, of a possible settlement to the war and she said you know we're tired we're all tired you know my men are mostly taken from assault units which means they're really tired because you know before they were doing drones they were you know they were fighting trench to trench um, and so the mood is changing there is a is a desire to to, to kind of end the war but we're, we're all aware we cover it ad nauseum on this podcast the difficulties of getting to that point um, and on that note um, something that President Zelensky said um, over the past couple of days caught my eye now he was speaking to journalists I think I think on Monday and I think the thing that, that really got picked up and reported at the time was his remarks about nuclear weapons and he kind of walked back kind of made out some remarks of his had been misreported before and said look you know we want a security guarantee um, because we gave up our nuclear weapons and we're not in NATO I'm not saying I want nuclear weapons now I'm saying we need the uh, the conventional deterrence that was the thing people picked out but there's something else he said about energy and it's this that if Russia and Ukraine were to agree to end strikes on energy infrastructure on one another's it could be a step towards ending the conflict um, so here's the quotation. We saw during the first peace summit, this is a summit they had in Switzerland uh, several months ago, that there could be a decision on energy security. In other words, we do not attack their in energy infrastructure. They don't attack ours. Could this lead to the end of the war's hot phase? I think so. And, and a couple of things to pull out of that, Francis. One is that, of course, if you think back to, if you remember the beginning of the Kursk offensive, um, Ukraine's Kursk offensive in August, there was some reporting at the time that that offensive had basically torpedoed a tentative deal along those lines um, for them both to stop hitting each other's energy infrastructure. It was kind of denied and played down at the time um, that there was any such agreement. There was talk that there had been some 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 discussions around it. How how close that was actually at the time to a deal um, is unclear. But I think it's very interesting to see him talking about that, talking about that 
this is this is really a kind of one of those practical steps that you can see being made that could be a building block in a trust building exercise leading to a cessation of hostilities and i think it's quite rare we actually see um anything that specific so it's interesting to uh, to, to see him saying that and the other phrase the phrase that is fascinating in here is ending the war's hot phase why is that interesting because it, it raises the idea that that this war is not going to be over when the you know the really intense fighting stops um, and this this brings up this question of of what comes next. President Zelensky denied that he was talking about this land for peace deal that we, you know has been discussed in the Western media a lot. The idea being that Ukraine effectively you know lets Russia hang on to what it's occupied for now, you know, while denying that it that it recognizes it, and perhaps the rest of Ukraine gets into NATO um, as a quid pro quo. Um, now, he denied that any such discussion is underway, but we know that's the kind of thing that is kind of doing the rounds, you know, in, in, in the smoke-filled rooms um, of, of Western capitals and indeed in newspaper columns. And we also know how the, the last Russian invasion ended. With uh, there, there was a hot phase that lasted about a year, 14 to 15, and then there was, you know, this eight-year kind of not quite frozen slightly congealed conflict now, i'm not f- for a moment suggesting that that is a that's a model to follow we we saw that 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 failed in the end but i think i think we're we're seeing this consensus building about how this war is going to end uh, possibly an end to a hot phase that is followed by a continuing war at a lower tempo perhaps and and my last thought on that francis i know i'm i'm droning on a little bit but um there's a third element here that that occurs to me, and that that kind of draws in this talk about you know North Korean troops um, and Iranian drones and and things like this. We've reported an awful lot about how you know Ukraine is on the back foot and potentially losing the the war of attrition at the moment. Probably true. I, you know, I stand by our reporting. But you know, I, I was speaking to some Western officials. Oh, I don't know, a week ago or something. Uh, and, and they were talking about the, the current plan, and they said, "Look, if if Ukraine, if we can help Ukraine get through this next little bit, what you see on the horizon, um, what our kind of analysis says, is that you're going to see Russia coming under more and more and more strain in 2025, um, going into 2026, um, and it's quite feasible we will be reaching a point where you know Russia cannot sustain the enormous losses that it's um, that it's suffering at the front." cannot sustain the enormous economic strains at some point possibly the attrition will get so bad for them that they too will be unable to maintain a quote-unquote hot phase of war a hot tempo of war and therefore things may end up uh, congealing along those lines a lot of speculation there but i think worth flagging in the context of um, just all those discussions that are going on and i'm sure things will move very very quickly after the u.s elections Well, thanks very much for that, Roland. Just to give you both a bit of a breather before our final thoughts, where we can cover anything else that we've not talked about today that's on your minds. Just another story I wanted to end with, because I think it's important. Since we're on the subject of global organisations coming under fire, obviously we've been talking about the UN the last few days. Another story caught my eye, which may sound small in the grand scheme, but I think is extremely telling, frankly. Listeners in Eastern Europe who grew up behind the Iron Curtain will be familiar with Radio Free Europe, also known as Radio Liberty, the international media organisation that broadcasts and reports news and analysis in Eastern Europe, Central Asia, the Caucasus and the Middle East too, I think. Now, during the Cold War, it was a vital means for the West to communicate to peoples living under oppressive regimes. And for many, it was a vital source of accurate information, a bit like the BBC World Service. Its work continues. But this week, Radio Free Europe reports itself that Apple has removed its app from the Russian version of its app store at the request of Russia's media regulatory agency. So Apple told Radio Liberty in a letter that the reason it removed the app is that it contained content that is illegal in Russia 
and materials from an organisation deemed undesirable, i.e. Radio Liberty, by the Russian authorities. Now, these removals have sparked concerns, of course, from independent media, NGOs and civil society activists who accuse Apple of aiding in the suppression of free speech in Russia. They've urged them to resist these actions and undermine, that they say are undermining international human rights standards and, of course, to work to also reinstate blocked VPN apps. Now, there have been many reports over the years of major American organisations censoring their content at the request of authoritarian regimes, which to me, to be completely upfront, is one of the scandals of the age, really, underreported and under-discussed. At times, it feels as if regimes get many of the advantages of Western technological innovation, but packaged in a way that maintains oppressive regimes' power. If peoples were faced with a choice between an all or nothing in terms of the offerings of freedom, as during the Cold War, people would surely choose the Western systems because of those innate qualities that they have. But today, politicians don't think in those terms. They see making money as a good in itself because it spreads capitalism, which is, they see, part of spreading democracy. But the weaknesses of that approach have been surely discredited by the actions we've seen in Russia and China over recent years. And yet the status quo in many ways persists. But An interesting story, very, very interested in listeners' perspective on that. And if you're listening in Eastern Europe or elsewhere and remember the work of Radio Liberty during the Cold War and its importance to you, I'd be really interested to hear it. And I'd love to read some of your memories over the coming days and weeks. So that's where we are in terms of updates today. Just leaves for me to go back to Dom and Roland for their final thoughts and anything else that we've not had a chance to cover. Dom, over to you, first of all. I'm I'm noting that the the uh, Ukrainian military intelligence effort called the I Want to Live project, which has been up for well, I think a couple of years now, since the very start of the full scale invasion, putting out um, messaging to Russians to try and try and entice them to leave their positions, leave their army, and and, uh, and come over to to the Ukrainian side. They've now extended that, and they're putting it out in the uh, language for the North Korean troops that uh, that we that we think are now in the country so these this is the i want to live project they put out a video which shows uh, and there's a there's a, a voiceover that describes this is the new detention camp for uh, north korean troops that will soon be arriving they say uh, it shows and it describes that there's three meals a day and the ration includes meat fresh veg and bread and they then show um, and describe the large warm and bright rooms with separate sleeping quarters so you know not not especially glossy in its production or in its offer but um uh, but quite clear that that's that they're appealing to the things that uh, that they say North Korean troops won't have experienced in their home country. Of course, big questions about well, how are they going to get this to the North Korean troops? How are they going to access it? But um, you know, all valid, very valid questions. But you've got to start somewhere. I think it's quite interesting that they've they've started so quickly. They'll come out the block so quickly with this uh, with this messaging direct to North Korean troops. Thanks very much, Dom. Roland, over to you for anything else you want to talk about. Uh, thank you for that um, that blank check you may come to regret, Francis. Rather like Germany to Austria in 1914. Anyway, um, let me let let me. There's a few things I want to get out there. The first thing, which which I didn't mention earlier, is that, that caught my eye and also made me think about you know a return to a normality, a kind of end of the hot war. Is there's an airline called um, Supernova, Ukrainian airline. They've just been granted permission or the right to uh, to fly two international routes between Prague and Lviv and Prague and Kiev. Um, it's the rights to seven flights a week on each route now. And that's uh, valid apparently from the 1st of November this year, you know, signed, steeled, stamped um, by the Ukrainian aviation authorities indefinitely now. Um, it's been made very, very clear in all the Ukrainian reporting on this that this is um, this is kind of speculative. All right, this doesn't th- this this is going to kick in when airspace is opened again. And, and just to remind listeners who haven't been there, um, civilian airspace in Ukraine is completely closed. You cannot fly in there um, on a on a civilian flight. Um, although, I mean, I suppose you could fly in on a 
on a on an F sixteen um, or a, a Mig twenty nine or something like that. But um, um, it, it would be a remarkable, remarkable development, I think, um, and it would really it would signal a a really change in the kind of tempo um, of the conflict if we get to a point where. Um, Ukraine can reopen at least even a couple of airports, even if it's just um, Lviv in the, in the far west, um, and people can can fly in there again, um, even if that doesn't doesn't stop the war. So, not saying it's going to happen. It's been made quite clear that this is not like proof that it's about to happen or anything like that. Um, maybe this company's just kind of you know put the paperwork through just in case speculatively maybe in a couple of years it will happen but it it, it reminded me of, of those very strange things that the war has done to Ukraine and how you know if we if we could conceive of that kind of situation uh, where you can fly back in that would that would mark a step change maybe a change maybe not, if not ending the war maybe that would be the kind of thing that you could signal kind of the end of what you'd call the hot phase and entering the, the cooler phase of the conflict um now quote from Mark Rutter, NATO Secretary General um, this is just out, I also welcome that today the UK and Germany are signing a new defence agreement that will bring their armed forces and defence industries even closer, further strengthening NATO's security um uh, whatever that means um, but that is uh, just out of NATO um, seconds ago and, and brought to you from Dom Nichols WhatsApp <laughs> um, um, now um, Francis if I may um, this is a this is a BBC investigation um, uh, by BBC Russian really fantastic um, interesting um, read by Olga Ivshin who is a fantastic journalist um, it, it's not about war crimes it's about ordinary crimes it's about Russians accused of crimes uh, are being offered um, the choice of going to the front instead of going to court so we've known you know ever since the summer of 2022 they were recruiting people from prison um, saying look you've got a chance of pardon Wagner obviously spearheaded that um, it's now kind of quite widespread these are people who have not even been sentenced these are people who've been charged have not had a trial they're saying you don't even have to go to trial you could go to trial or um, you can sign up and go to the front so it's a massive massive expansion um, of that program and yeah I don't think it's a it's a massive leap to get from there to um, you know the idea of Russia looking to expand that pool of recruits as much as it can without going to a full mobilization um, which we've talked about before because Vladimir Putin doesn't want to shatter his social contract um, which in turn leads us to that idea of Russia also laboring under the um, the strains um, of of attritional war um, highly recommend read that get into that it's on the on the BBC website um, right now lots of lots of case studies in there um, of examples of people who've been caught up in that. Ukraine The Latest is an original podcast from The Telegraph, created by David Knowles. To support our work and to stay on top of all of our Ukraine news, analysis and dispatches from the ground, please subscribe to The Telegraph. You can get your first three months for just £1 at www.telegraph.co.uk slash Ukraine The Latest. Or sign up to Dispatches, our foreign affairs newsletter, bringing stories from our warning foreign correspondents straight to your inbox. We also have a Ukraine Live blog on our website where you can follow updates as they come in throughout the day, including insights from regular contributors to this podcast. We also do the same for other breaking international stories. You can listen to this conversation live at 1pm London time each weekday on X Spaces. Follow The Telegraph on X, formerly known as Twitter, so that you don't miss it. To our listeners on YouTube, please note that due to issues beyond our control, there is sometimes a delay between broadcast and upload. So if you want to hear Ukraine the latest as soon as it is released, do please refer to podcast apps. If you appreciated this podcast, please consider following Ukraine the latest on your preferred podcast app and leave us a review as it really does help others find the show. Please also share it with those who may not be aware we exist. You can also get in touch directly to ask questions or give comments by emailing ukrainepod at telegraph.co.uk. We do continue to read every single message. You can also contact us directly on X. You'll find our handles in the description for this episode. As ever, we're especially interested to hear where you're listening from around the world. Ukraine The Latest was today produced by executive producers Louisa Wells and David Knowles. <laughs>